chapter three, it's the first part of chapter three, which takes a very uh, basic look at the foundations of a macroeconomy and really how we measure it, which is the production function. And we're also going to look at a related um, issue with the production function and thinking about the important role of technology. So our objectives are twofold, really, to take a first look at the production function and what it looks like, but also look more closely at the role of, of um, total factor productivity. And as we'll see later on in uh, chapter six and seven, total factor productivity is going to take a very important role in uh, understanding the role of growth and how economies grow over time. So the first step is to take a look at our production function and um, So if we look at our production function, we have a very basic setup. We assume that our economy is uh, dictated by some production function, which we're going to call F. Okay, So this is like a black box, which we have inputs that go into this black box, and then it spits out some level of output or production or income Y. And then we have two basic inputs that we're going to assume. The first is capital, and we're going to denote that with a K, and the amount of labor in the economy, and we're going to denote that with an L. And so the idea is simply that we have these inputs into production, we dump them into this black box, this production function, and it spits out some level of output um, uh, for, for the economy, which can be used um, uh, to produce goods and services. And so we're going to make two basic assumptions. And I'll explain this in a little bit more detail in a second. But we're going to assume, <clears throat> excuse me, we're going to assume both capital and labor are what's referred to as exogenous. Okay. So the idea is simply that those are uh, predetermined. And in some sense, you can think of them as just dropping from the sky. Okay. So these are not things that we can control, but they're just things that are are predetermined in the long run. Now, keep in mind, again, in this chapter and in ensuing chapters, we're looking at the economy from a long-run focus. And so what that means is that, uh, again, these, these, well, the level of capital and the level of labor that's going to be available to the economy is predetermined. At some point in the future, two or three or four years from now, there's going to be some set amount of capital and labor, and there's nothing that we can do about it. So that's what we mean by exogenous or predetermined. They're sort of fixed in the sense that, they're predetermined in the long run. And so if we put these uh, things into our production function, then what that means is if we assume that the level of technology really dictates our production function and what that looks like, right? So if we think about technology, we think about not only um, computers and information uh, sharing and, and those kinds of things, but we also think about the ways in which we put capital and labor together in this production process to spit out some level of output. So that's what we refer to or mean as, uh, by technology. So if we assume that technology is going to be sort of fixed or predetermined in the long run as well as our inputs, which we're assuming, then at the end of the day, what that means is that the total amount of output produced is also going to be predetermined or fixed. It's simply dictated by the amount of capital, the amount of labor, and the amount of technology that's going to be available through this production process. So <clears throat> that's what our, uh, the basic framework for this production function looks like. Now, if we look at a very special type of a very special type of production function. It's what's referred to as a Cobb-Douglas production function. So this has a few uh, specific properties, which I'll talk about here in a second. But again, we have this basic production function framework. But in this Cobb-Douglas production function, we're going to assume that it looks like the following. So we're going to assume that the certain amount of capital that we have and the certain amount of labor that we have, if we take those to the 3 tenths and the 7 tenths power, respectively, and we multiply it by this parameter A, then that's going to spit out 
the level of output that we're going to be able to produce as an economy. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so as we'll see later on, these exponents right here actually have very specific interpretations and meanings. Essentially, what we'll see later on is that those exponents represent the share of income that's devoted to capital, for instance, and the share of income that wage earners or laborers' uh, share of income gets. And so we'll see that that uh, we'll see exactly how we get that interpretation um, later on in the chapter in another video. But it turns out that this Cobb-Douglas production function exhibits what's returns uh, exhibits what's referred to as constant returns to scale. Okay. Now this is sort of a technical assumption. Um, and one of the reasons why it's assumed that, and the, the outcome of that, of which is the exponents that you see on capital and labor sum to one, okay? And so the implication of this um, result is that if we double, if we exactly double or exactly triple or exactly scale all of our capital and labor by the exact same amount, then we'll get that scaled amount out of our production process in terms of output. Okay, so in other words, if we double capital and we double labor, we should exactly double the amount of output that we get. And so we can see this if we, for instance, scale our capital and labor by some parameter, we'll call it Z. Okay, so here's our production function. We're going to multiply the amount of capital that we have by this parameter z, and we're going to multiply the amount of labor that we get by this parameter z as well. And so if we do a couple quick steps of math, you can see that that z is going to sort of fall out So if we have z to the 0.3 times z to the 0.7, we add the exponents so we get z to the 1 power, which is just z. And so that's equal to a times z times k to the 0 0.3, l to the 0 0.7. Well, that's just z multiplied times y, the total amount of output produced. So what did we just do here? Well, we just demonstrated this constant returns to scale property. If we double or triple or multiply by z all of our inputs, we get exactly z times the amount of output produced out of that production process. So again, this is one special property of, um, of the constant returns to scale uh, of, of the, of the Cobb-Douglas production function, rather. Okay. Um, now let me just switch back to our slides. So one of the other things that we want to, to look at is um, the, the production function in terms of the slope. Okay, so the slope is actually going to have a pretty important meaning as well. And it turns out that this production function exhibits what's referred to as diminishing marginal returns. And so the basic idea here is that when we add more workers into the production process, if we hold all the other inputs constant, then you're going to increase production, but you're not going to be as efficient as it, uh, as, at, at production as you move along. Okay, So you can imagine in a production process when you first start adding some workers into the production process, those workers get really efficient, especially if they have a lot of capital available to them. But as you add more workers, eventually the workers are going to start bumping into them. They'll have less and less capital per person. And so at the end of the day, those workers that you add are going to raise total production. But on the margin, they're not going to be as efficient as the previous workers that they had before them. Okay, So that's what we mean by diminishing marginal returns. And the way it manifests itself in the production process is uh, in the production function, rather, is that as we add inputs holding everything else constant, output goes up, 
but at a decreasing rate, okay? So what this means then is that we get on our production function a positive slope but it increases at a so-called decreasing rate. Okay, and so if we look at our a simple production function, you can see it's going to look something like that, right? And so again, as we add more inputs into the production process, what you can see is that output is going to go up, but it's going to go up by a lesser and lesser amount as we move farther along the production uh, the production function. And so. At the end of the day, again, this diminishing marginal returns, again, has an important interpretation in that we get less and less efficient as we add more inputs, okay? Now, one of the important things to note here is that we can measure the slope of this production function as the marginal product of capital or the marginal product of labor, okay? So, very simply, the marginal product of labor, for instance, there's two ways we can do this. We can do it, uh, the, I guess, the more simplified way, which is to say, well, if we add some amount of labor to the production process, then how much output do we get from that increase in labor, okay? And again, we're assuming capital is held constant. So that's just the change in output given some change in labor, okay? Now for your calculus buffs out there, um, I'm not gonna talk about this too much, but this is also the derivative of the production function with respect to uh, the amount of labor you have. And likewise, we can talk about the marginal product of capital, which is the analogous one here. And so that's going to be the uh, MPK. That's just the change in output given a change in capital. Okay. And again, it's for you calculus buffs, it's going to be the uh, derivative of output with respect to, with respect to capital. Okay. And so with this Cobb-Douglas production function, it turns out that we can actually derive expressions for the marginal product of labor, okay? So for the marginal product of labor, again, we can take the production function, take the derivative of it, and it turns out when you do that and solve, an expression for the marginal product of labor is given by 7 tenths times the ratio of output per worker, okay? And incidentally, this is also equal to 7 tenths times A times K over L to the 0 0.3 power, okay? So I'll leave you to solve for that on your own to figure out where that comes from. Likewise, with the marginal product of capital, uh, we can use our friend calculus to derive an expression for this formally. Um, it turns out that the expressions for the marginal product of capital are three tenths times output divided by the level of capital, which again is also equivalent to 0 0.3 times A times L over K, all to the seven tenths power. Okay. So those are our, our expressions for the marginal product of labor and capital. Those are going to come in handy later on um, when we look at um, a few more examples. But let's get back to the production function and look back at the, uh, again, at the intuition behind um, the issue of diminishing marginal returns. So if we have a production function, suppose that its output is equal to 10 times K to the 0 0.3 times L to the 0 0.7, okay? So again, this parameter, which we're going to talk about later on, 
uh, as being the total factor productivity parameter, that A parameter. We're just assuming it's 10, okay? So it doesn't matter where that comes from. Um, but this is our, our production function. Now, let's assume the level of capital is equal to 1,000. If we plug that into our production function, then we can solve, as it turns out, our production function is going to simplify to something that looks like this, 79.43 times L to the 0 0.7. Okay, and so very simply, if we look at this production function, we can plot some points on it. And this is where the diminishing marginal uh, returns come in. So um, here we have this function which relates the level of labor to the amount of output produced. So we're going to measure by convention the amount of, amount of labor on the horizontal axis and the amount of output on the vertical axis. Okay, and so it turns out this production function will look something like this. And so <clears throat> what we can, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, what we can do is just plot some points. So if L is equal to 100, it turns out, and you can verify this on your own, you plug it into your calculator, output is going to be equal to 1995.3. Now if we add one more worker to the production process, it turns out that output is equal to 2,009.2, okay? And so we can plot these points here at a level of labor of 100. You have output equal to 1995.3, and if we add one more worker, you have 2009.2. And so <clears throat> you can see there the change in L is equal to 1. And if we increase our labor by one more unit, the amount of output that we get, the change in Y is just given by the difference between these two. So if you just take the difference there, again, you can do the math on your own. The change in y is equal to 13.9. Okay. So that's our marginal productivity of labor at, say, 100. So going from 100 to 101, we add one worker, we increase output by 13.9. Now, what if instead we said, well, if labor is equal to 1,000, what's output going to be? Well, again, you can do the math here. It turns out that uh, production is equal to 10,000 at that point. If we increase labor by one more unit, in this case, output ends up increasing to about 10,007. Okay. So you can see here, in this case, the marginal product of labor is equal to 7. And so, again, we can go farther along on our curve here. There's 1,000. There's 1,001. There's our change in labor equal to 1. And again, you can see our change in output is smaller at 7 rather than 13.9. So again, this, uh, this is just an example to show you how you can see the diminishing marginal returns here. Okay, so <clears throat> as I said, uh, one of the things that's going to be important, especially in the discussions in later chapters, is this role of productivity. And so our productivity is more specifically uh, referred to as total factor productivity, okay? And so this is going to be this A parameter that we saw with our production function. So the idea of total factor productivity, again, if we look at our production function, 
it says we have inputs into the production process. How do we put our inputs, i.e. capital and labor, together with uh, technology and know-how and all of those things that go into producing goods and services? How do we cram those things together to get some level of output out? Okay, so the better technology we have, the better knowledge that we have, um, the more innovation that we have in the manufacturing process to squeeze more output out of our inputs, the higher that, that A parameter is going to be. And so we call it total factor productivity because it's how we put both capital and labor together to enhance production and increase production. Okay, so it's not specific to only capital or only labor, and in particular, we don't think about it as having more fancy machinery. That's part of it, but uh, it, it's really more how we put the capital and labor together to be able to produce output more efficiently. So that's why we call it total factor productivity. Okay. And so it's slightly, by the way, this is slightly different than labor productivity. So we can measure labor productivity as simply the ratio of output per worker, okay? So given a, a set of workers in the production process, how much total output do we get out of that? Then on average, how much are workers producing? That's what our measure of labor productivity is. So you can see that this is slightly different um, than total factor productivity. Now, we can't directly measure total factor productivity, but we can indirectly measure it in the following way. With our Cobb-Douglas production function, we can simply solve for A as a function of everything else. And so if we do that, total factor productivity is going to look like, uh, can be inferred from our levels of production, known amount of capital, and known amount of labor from labor markets, okay? So if we have information on capital stock, the amount of labor in the labor force, and total amount of goods produced, which are easily, all of those things are pretty easily measured, then we can get measures of total factor productivity uh, over time. <clears throat> okay, so as I said, this total factor productivity, this A parameter is gonna be important uh, in our discussions later on, so keep that in mind. Now, again, when thinking about how well off an economy is, a lot of times we think about, well, how much income or how much goods do we produce? But it turns out that Total income is a poor measure of standard of living. And so if we're looking at economies and looking at countries and thinking about, well, how well off are these countries economically or socially or whatever, the amount of output that you produce isn't necessarily a good indicator, okay? To give you some examples, uh, China is the second largest uh, economy in the world. They produce something like $5 trillion and growing of total GDP or total production. But they have a really large population. And so even though they have the second highest total production in the world, that production and income is spread over a large amount of people. And so the amount of output on average per person is, is much, much lower in China than it is, say, in Japan, which is the number three economy in, in the world in terms of um, standard of living. And so a better measure of a standard of living is to think about, whoops, standard of living, <clears throat> is to think about the role of output per person or if there is a pretty stable relationship between labor force participation and population, we can simply think about our standard of living as being a measure of output per worker, okay? And so that's really, again, the more important uh, part of thinking about this is if we're trying to measure how well off an economy is, what's the best measure? Well, typically we think about it in terms of output per capita or output per person. And in this class, for the most part, we're gonna think of those two things as being synonymous, okay? So rather than using our Cobb-Douglas production function to measure total production and total income and perhaps compare that across countries, a better, uh, more appropriate way to measure standard of living across countries would be to measure output per person or output per worker. And so we can rearrange our 
our standard Cobb Douglas production function to take this into account. So the way we do this is we simply divide our production function by L on both sides. So we have Y over L on the left hand side. We have this divided by L part right there, right? And so if we solve for this, that's going to be A times, <coughs> excuse me, uh, K to the 0 0.3, L to the minus 0 0.3. So we have L to the 0.7 times L to the minus 1. Again, we have a common base. We add the exponents. So 0 0.7 minus 1 is negative 0.3. We can rearrange this slightly differently as A times K over L to the 0 0.3 power. Okay? And on the, right, on the left hand side, rather, we have this measure Y over L. So we're going to make a notation change to simplify this a little bit. We're going to call this ratio of output per worker, or again, we think about this as output per person, as simply little y. So total output per, per, per person or per worker is just given by this little y. And then we're also going to denote our, the ratio of capital per worker available as a little k. And so when we do that, we can simplify our Cobb-Douglas production function in the following way. Total output per worker, that's little y, is just going to be equal to a times little k to the point 0.3. So there's some basic things that we can um, get from this. First of all, what this tells us is that in order to increase our standard of living, we can increase total factor productivity or that A parameter. So that's one way that economies can improve their standard of living. The second is by increasing the capital stock and more specifically increasing the capital stock available per worker. So having more capital available per worker makes each worker more efficient and therefore will produce more output which you can spread across the same amount of people, thereby increasing the standard of living. And so that's the main punchline in, in terms of thinking about, um, again, why technology is important, but also why capital uh, is important. And so uh, if we um, look at this uh, relationship here, again, what I, whoops, what I just simplified here is that production function, right? So we can look at those two pieces, the technology piece and the capital piece. So this is a measure. <coughs> excuse me, this is a measure of the amount of capital per person in the first column there, and it's measured relative to the United States, right? So the United States is one in all of these columns because everything is measured relative to the U.S. And so if we take that measure of capital per person and we multiply, uh, sorry, we take it to the 0.3 power, you get this thing right there. And so this is the important thing to see is uh, when we put that in together with total factor productivity, then that, those two columns multiplied together gives us this thing here. Now, what are we to take away from this? Well, there's a couple of examples. So first of all, look at Japan. So Japan has a lot of capital per person, but you can see their total factor productivity is relatively low. So when you combine those two things together, their output per person relative to the United States is somewhat low, right? Um, the flip side of this is if you look at, say, the UK, in this data anyway, they have a relatively low capital per person or per worker. And so when we combine that with a somewhat higher total factor productivity, then they end up third in this measure of output per person. Okay, so the punchline is that both of these things together are important in trying to understand standard of living and uh, output per person. Okay. Um, 
excuse me. So again, this is um, a summary of the production function. We have the capital uh, here that we're measuring holding labor constant. So as we move up and down along this production function, you can see that output is going to increase, but at a decreasing rate. And we get the same result with um, uh, our labor. So here we're holding capital constant, and as we vary the amount of labor, oops, if, as we vary the amount of labor in the economy, then that's going to give us differing amounts of output, and we get this diminishing margin returns. Okay. So the last thing I want to talk about is um, supply shocks and how it relates to uh, this production function. So in general, there's uh, various factors which are going to affect uh, this production function and affect the relationship between the inputs to production and the actual amount of output produced. And so generally we talk about them as being supply shocks. So we can have positive supply shocks which enhance the productive capacity of the economy. So holding our inputs constant, if we get a beneficial supply shock that allows us to produce more output with the given inputs that we have, or at least the ones that we're measuring on our horizontal axis here. And so that's good because that means higher incomes, but as we'll see, it also means that those inputs become more productive, and that's going to be important later on when we talk about uh, um, shares of income and wage growth in particular. And so we can also have negative supply shocks, and so if we have a negative supply shock, and I'll talk about these in a second, that's going to have the effect of rotating down that production function. Okay. <clears throat> so, <coughs> excuse me, um, so we can have uh, different types of supply shocks. Again, these are going to mostly be affecting uh, our technology available, and that impacts the amount of output produced. But we can also think about it in some ways impacting inputs uh, to the production process. So the, the three basic sources of uh, supply shocks are technology shocks. So uh, again, reductions in total factor productivity. When we're thinking about technology, we're not thinking about the computer on our, our desk or you know, how we use the internet. Although those are important, they're not the only way in which we think about, as macroeconomists, the role of technology. So anything that's going to impact total factor productivity can shift our supply, uh, can shift the, supply, the, the, the production function. Um, Environmental or natural disasters, so if we have a, a particularly poor wet winter, which destroys a bunch of crops, um, that could have the effect of reducing our raw materials inputs, which reduces production of agricultural goods, which ther therefore produ reduces uh, production of total production. Um, likewise, we can have things like uh, uh, natural da disasters like earthquakes or hurricanes or something that disrupt production supply chains and disrupt the production process itself. Again, that results, um, typically these environmental or natural disaster shocks result in a negative supply shock, although you can have an environmental one with agricultural base, which I talked about before, where it would be a positive supply shock. If you have a bumper crop one year, then that can raise uh, production. And lastly, energy shocks. So if we have really high oil prices, that results in um, increases in the production uh, Costs to firms, typically that, that results in the cutback in production over longer periods of time, particularly if these energy shocks are long-lived. And so that can have adverse consequences on uh, production. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and so this is what a negative supply shock looks like. So uh, again, the production function is going to be rotating in a downwards manner. So if we're holding, in this case, the level of capital constant, then what that means is that the total amount of output that we produce declines. But more importantly, what it also means is you can see that the slope of, oops, you can see that the slope of, can you put that? Oops. Bear with us for just one minute. Okay. Well, I'll just talk through this. Um, so what it means then is the slope of <coughs> the marginal product of capital gets lower. You can see that, that that line gets a little bit flatter, meaning the marginal product of capital decreases. Okay, That has important implications for uh, the, the, the income that capital earners are going to earn. 
um, as a result. And likewise, if we see um, <coughs> if we see a, a, a negative supply shock, which pu pushes the production function downward, again, that has the result of if we're holding, for instance, capital constant or something like that or whatever, if we're also holding labor constant here, then you can see that the slope of that marginal product of labor gets flatter. And so the productivity on the margin of workers goes down. And as we'll see, as, as I said, as we'll see later on, that's going to have implications for how much workers are paid. Okay. Now, in this case, again, if we're thinking about holding labor constant, there's two basic sources through which this supply shock can occur. It can occur through declines in the total level of capital or declines in the level of total factor productivity. Both of those are going to adversely affect the marginal product of labor and therefore also because of the production function are going to affect the total amount of output produced here. Okay. So as I said, we'll talk more about this, the, uh, why this is important, particularly for wage growth and, and the implications for that in the next video. Thank you.